So we started with an um, illustrative example of instrumental variables in the case of uh, uh, measurement errors. So uh, let's next uh, look into some theory to see how the instrumental variables function and why, why instrumental variables regression leads to an unbiased uh, estimator. And I will try to keep the theory relatively uh, light and intuitive. So I will start with the, with a single regression case and a single instrument. Okay. So this simplifies uh, things a little bit that we focus on the, on the single regression. And I also just assume that we have a single instrument C and uh, recall that the assumption is that, uh, that uh, originals X variable, uh, can be endogenous. But we have instrument Z that is uh, uncorrelated with the uh, error term epsilon, but it's correlated with the uh, with the uh, regressor X. Okay. So let's we are in part, again uh, mainly interested in the slope coefficient beta two. Okay. So we are we are not really interested in the the intercept beta one, but mainly focus on beta two. And uh, firstly, recall. How we have uh, derived the OLS estimator for the for the slope beta two, so we found that it's uh, it's the ratio of the sample covariance of x and y, and the sample variance of x, and uh, this formula I can also then uh, expand a little bit. So notice that if I if I break down this uh, uh, in the denominator, this x i minus x upper bar to power two. We can we can get it in two parts and uh, and notice now that in the nominator and denominator we have this uh, blue colored expression and the last uh, last part of the equation where which states uh, x i minus x upper bar so the difference of the observed x i from its its uh, sample mean so the same expression is uh, in both uh, nominator and denominator so I have highlighted this expression in in blue color for reason, because then uh, to understand what the instrumental variable estimator do is that uh, we actually replace this uh, blue expression with now with the with the z variable. So so uh, in both nominator and denominator, this x i minus x upper bar is replaced by z i minus z upper bar when we use the instrumental variable. Okay. So in other words, then the instrumental variable estimator can be written as the ratio of the sample covariance of uh, Z and Y and the sample covariance of Z and uh, X. So st we're still working very hard, heavily on the, on the covariances and correlation of, of variables. This also give, can give you some intuition that why this, uh, why this um, uh, instrument should be uncorrelated with the error term, but highly correlated with the with uh, X and Z because the sample covariance of X and Z is actually in this uh, uh, denominator of this ratio. Okay. So this is how the instrumental variable uh, estimator is, uh, is defined in the case of single regression and when we have a single instrument only. I'll discuss you later the case that we have multiple instruments. So let's also then use some of our insights of the of that in the previous lesson. So recall that when we studied the properties of the of the OLS estimator, uh, then we proved the unbiasedness of the OLS estimator in the single regression case by plugging into the formula this uh, this uh, regression equation and showing that the expected value of the OLS estimator was equal to the uh, true beta two coefficient. We can actually prove the uh, unbiasedness of the instrumental variable estimator in the same way. So I do not go through the formula in, in detail, so you can compare it to the to the le previous lesson on uh, on um, properties of the OLS estimator, and you can verify that in the case of the instrumental variable estimator, then this uh, B2, uh, our IV estimator, is equal to the true beta 2 plus an error component, and this error component is the ratio of the sample covariance of uh, Z and Epsilon and the sample covariance of Z and X. So again, here we have this, uh, these two sample covariances. So, so uh, uh, we do obtain an unbiased estimator 
when the population covariance of, uh, of C and epsilon is equal to zero. And this is what we assume uh, in the instrumental variables estimator. So we assume that this, uh, this instrument is uh, uncorrelated with the, with the epsilon. So this is why then the expected value of the sample covariance of C and epsilon would go to zero. And we have an unbiased estimator. But also we want to have this uh, uh, correlation of Z and X to be high because then uh, even by accident, of course, there is some kind of uh, uh, sample covariance between Z and Epsilon. So even if, if they have the population, there is no, no connection between Z and Epsilon by assumption, but uh, even by accident in any sample, there is always some covariance. So this covariance, sample covariance is really exactly equal to zero. There's some, some uh, incidental covariance. And, and therefore, it's very good that this, uh, this uh, Z and X would be highly correlated because then uh, this uh, sample covariance of C and Epsilon is always proportionate to the, to the sample covariance of, uh, of Z and X. So this formula really highlights this uh, importance of the two assumptions of why it is important that uh, Z doesn't correlate with Epsilon, but it is highly correlated with X. Okay. So that's the theory why, why the instrumental variable estimator uh, works and why it is an unbiased estimator if only these two assumptions hold. But other than that, uh, then uh, you are free to then search for any, any instrument that uh, satisfies those, condi those conditions. So um, what about the variance of the instrumental variable estimator? So this is also something that we discussed earlier in the case of OLS estimator when we considered uh, the efficiency of the uh, OLS estimator. By the same reasoning, <clears throat> we can show that the variance of the IV estimator for the, for the slope uh, B2 um, is the variance of the error term epsilon divided by uh, the product of three components, uh, which are uh, N minus one, that is, depends on the sample size. Uh, the second component is variance of X variable and the third one is most interesting. That's the correlation coefficient between the regressor X and the instrument Z to power two. Okay, so this formula also highlights that, uh, that uh, of course, uh, the, the variance, uh, so in some sense, the precisions of, precision of the instrumental variable estimator um, decreases the, the larger the, uh, this uh, disturbance term, variance of the disturbance term epsilon is, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, larger sample size is uh, helping to improve the precision. Larger variance on, of the explanatory variables is helpful, like we have always emphasized. And also high correlation between uh, Z and X uh, is, is useful. And high, I mean, by absolute terms. So, so it can be also negative correlation. So if, if we have a negative correlation, uh, but, uh, but the squared value of the correlation coefficient is high, then that's also, also helpful. So the correlation between X and Z doesn't have to be necessarily positive. It can be also, also negative correlation. So I also wanted to illustrate to you in the matrix form that, uh, that how, the, how, the, uh, how the instrumental variable estimator looks like when we have multiple X variables and we can might have multiple instruments. So in the similar way, this, uh, we replace some of this uh, data matrix X with, uh, with the matrix of instruments Z. So in the matrix form, then uh, the instrumental variable estimator looks like, like that. So if you want to understand the, the statistical properties of the instrumental variable estimator more, more thoroughly, then it's necessary to resort to the matrix algebra. So this goes, uh, goes to some extent beyond the, beyond the scope of the, of the present course. So I will discuss with you some, some of the issues with the, when we have multiple instruments in the, in the next lesson. But uh, at this point, I want to highlight you one interesting fact that uh, remember that uh, the OLS estimator we, we def derived by starting from this least squares problem that we, where we minimize the sum of squares of the residuals. However, the instrumental variables estimator, uh, we did not minimize anything. We didn't derive it that way at all. We just started from this, uh, this uh, 
uh, by analog with the, with the OLS estimator and just kind of expanded the OLS estimator in, in that sense. So in that sense, the instrumental variables estimator is not really uh, at least not originally developed as the least squares estimator at all, but it's built on a slightly different estimation principle. And for sake of uh, uh, clarity, I want to want to uh, briefly give some intuitive uh, illustration for that. Uh, so it also paves the way to the future topics of this course. So indeed, uh, it's not always necessary to start from this kind of uh, minimization of the sum of squares. So there are also alternative uh, uh, estimation approaches to the linear regression and uh, GMM or generalized method of moments is uh, one popular approach nowadays that to, to estimating uh, linear regression models and uh, here to, to illustrate this uh, this uh, connection to the ordinary least squares I wanted to highlight that uh, these um, regression residuals from the ordinary least squares have always this property that uh, if we multiply the the explanatory variable x with the residual e and sum over all observations then then uh, then uh, the sum of this uh, these uh, products is uh, equal to zero so that means that the sample covariance of x and the, the residuals e is always equal to zero by construction so this is something that the ordinary least squares estimators uh, satisfy always whatever whatever data you might have so uh, you can easily check it also you can for example in excel you can use this uh, sum product function to take the the x variable and the residuals and uh, and you can find that the sum product is equal to zero or you can also calculate the sample covariance you will get the zero and that also applies to each and every explanatory variable so if you have a multiple regression model then every regressor uh, should be uncorrelated with the regression residual Otherwise, you have some kind of a, a syntax error or com computational error if that's not the case in OLS. So, if you think about it, then then uh, this relates to the to the to the assumption of uh, uh, endogeneity that we positioned posited earlier. So remember that uh, that uh, unbiasedness of uh, of the OLS estimator essentially relied on this assumption that covariance of x and epsilon is equal to zero. So that's another way of stating the exogeneity assumption. So uh, the idea of the GMM estimator would then start from this kind of population condition, like, like uh, for example, one, one possibility is indeed to state that covariance of X and Epsilon is equal to zero and find what is the sample counterpart. So obviously then the sample counterpart would be that sample covariance of X and uh, E residuals e is equal to zero for all x okay so we have this kind of again this analog between population uh, population covariance and and sample covariance and uh, the idea of the gmm estimator would be to then use this kind of uh, uh, starting from this population uh, orthogonality conditions and uh, state and corresponding sample sample properties so in fact the, the ols estimator would then satisfy this kind of uh, kind of uh, sample orthogonality condition and uh, we could in, indeed instead of minimizing the sum of squares of errors I have here taken such kind of a uh, couple of shortcuts I assume that we have centered the data and put the intercept uh, equal to zero so uh, so we could uh, but in general also we could uh, we could start from this kind of sample orthogonality sorry population orthogonality condition and develop the OLS estimator as a sample counterpart to this kind of uh, orthogonality condition. Same is, same is actually true for the instrumental variables estimator. So the instrumental variable estimator has also the, the property that if we take the sum product of uh, GIs and the residuals of the instrumental variable regression, then, uh, then the sum product is equal to zero. Or in other wo words, the sample covariance of uh, of uh, z's and the residuals is always equal to zero in the instrumental variable regression so um, in the same way also we can take as the population orthogonality that uh, the sample covariance of z and epsilon is equal to to sorry population orthogonality condition is that the 
covariance of C and epsilon is equal to zero. So the corresponding sample counterpart is that sample covariance of, uh, of C and residual E is equal to zero. And, and therefore we can derive the instrumental uh, variable estimator from that perspective. So indeed this uh, generalized method of moment is, uh, is the uh, relevant uh, estimation framework when, when, uh, when using the instrumental variables and particularly theory of uh, instrumental variables. But as I mentioned already, this goes a uh, uh, little bit too deep in, in uh, theory for the purposes of, uh, of the present course. So mainly it's important to understand that uh, why it is important that, uh, that these instruments should be uncorrelated for, with, the, with, the, with this uh, uh, error term epsilon, but, uh, but highly correlated with the, with the X variable. And uh, also, I wanted to highlight that uh, when you do the, do the instrumental variable estimation, for example, in Stata, so in Excel, you do not have this kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, instrumental variable regression option. So in, in Excel, we could do this kind of two-stage estimation, which I did in this uh, uh, introductory example, but it's not really necessary to do such kind of two-stage estimations. For example, in Stata, it can be done uh, in, in one stage. So, so there's no reason to, to calculate it in two stages. However, these two stages can be, can be kind of intuitive way to think about the instruments. At least for, for, for me, I find it uh, intuitive. But uh, when you do, for example, instrumental variable regression in Stata, then Stata doesn't do such kind of two stages, or, or not necessarily at least. So in the next lesson, I will then discuss you with some, some uh, over-identification, which refers to the case that, uh, that we have more instruments than we have endogenous uh, variables. Okay, so bye-bye.